All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Grody. I am a data center solutions architect with uh, Ally Digital. Today we're going to be talking about uh, PowerShell feedback providers. Feedback providers are a new feature that's been new into PowerShell 7.4. It's actually still currently an experimental feature. But what they will allow you to do is they will allow you to provide certain kinds of feedback for um, the results of commands uh, for users. So they can be very useful for a lot of things. Um, and we'll go about what those aspects are about being able to contribute more and help guide users to um, better solutions. <clears throat> got a little bit of a tickle in my throat for some reason today, so I apologize if I cough a little bit here. So, um, first off, love, why is that not advancing? Let's try this again. I know what it is, because, there we go. Uh, so thanks to the uh, sponsors, um, as usual, they make this thing happen. Um, they make it so I can see my friends, and I always appreciate that. Uh, and uh, yeah, but all these are like really great products. Uh, we use some of them uh, within Ally Digital and such, and I'm very happy to have them. And of course, thank you to Ally Digital specifically. Uh, that's my company. They sponsored my travel so I could be here. So thanks so much to that. Uh, we're a global MSP. We manage IT departments. We do all kinds of Azure. We do all kinds of stuff. So if uh, you need anything possibly in IT and you want a team full of people like me, give us a call. So um, as far as feedback providers go, I always like to start with the why. So what is the point of taking the time to learn how to make feedback providers and either integrating them into modules or providing modules that provide them? So what feedback providers do is they allow you to provide a little bit of extra information for any kind of command, whether it's successful or failure, and be able to help empower users to sort of self-solve their own problems. So if there's a particular um, error that you know, oh, we know that when you see this error, um, you need to log in or you need to, um, you forgot to set up this other thing, or have you considered you know, checking all this information? You can pop up a little message that can give that user that information. So it's not that complicated of a thing, but it's pretty powerful because you're able to utilize um, what's called the abstract syntax, that abstract syntax tree, as well as all of the information that's in that exception to customize and modify your message to be able to present to a user. So they can be used for things like um, a very common one that is in, um, in the extension, uh, in the extension. In PowerShell 7.4, once you enable the feature, is one called the command not found provider, which is one that if you, miss, if you type a command and it can't find it, this is a feedback provider that's been written to sort of do a fuzzy search and find maybe what the command you were thinking of, and then it'll pop up a little thing with the feedback provider saying, hey, did you, you know, if you type, if you type grip, you know, it's like, hey, did you mean grep, you know, and so that kind of a thing um, makes it really useful to help guide, especially new users, uh, to get better information and, and be able to work better and solve their problems faster without having to resort to trawling the web and spending two hours and finally realizing they mistyped something, which I've never done. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I mean, like you know, when when you get to my level, like that never happens. So you, you'll be fine. You'll, yeah. So these are these are for beginners, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and one other thing too is you can always also suggest better practices because you can write feedback providers based on the success of an output. Um, the feed, uh, <clears throat> you could, you know, a command may could be completed, but for instance, you could have a command where they do something and it has like a bunch of really short aliases in it. And maybe the user want, doesn't actually even know what the full commands are for those. So they could install your, you know, better, you know, aliases reminder feedback provider module. And whenever they use an alias, it can pop up and say, hey, you know, maybe you should try using the full version of the command. And here's the full version of the command that you used at this point in the script. So that's pretty much the core of, of what they are. Um, so they are a, um, basically a PowerShell interface, or excuse me, a C-sharp interface that you implement. So this is from the, the docs, which are linked there in the slides, which I'll bring up. But you just Google how to, literally Google how to create a feedback provider. It'll be like the first result. And so the way that this works is that uh, they're a function of the console host in PowerShell. So this is something that happens at what is so, sort of the UI level of the PowerShell. If you don't know this, there's the PowerShell core, and then there's the PowerShell host. And the host is like what translates what's going on in the PowerShell engine and shows it to you on the screen. So if you're in Windows Terminal or if you're in the command line, you get the default console host. But there are other hosts you can implement. For instance, Visual Studio Code has its own special host because of the way that it does that fancy client server stuff that Andy talked about yesterday. Um, there's hosts that, for instance, if it runs in um, a web server, to be able to like take any of the information records and stuff and output that in a certain way or convert it to HTML or that kind of a thing. So that host layer uh, has to implement the ability to display this feedback. And as of today, the VS Code one doesn't. So 
The biggest thing I'll do is as you're writing these, don't test them in the PowerShell extension window. Test them in a fresh PowerShell window because as of today, they don't work in VS Code. We're gonna get that wired up, but as of today, it doesn't work. Um, mostly because this is still an experimental feature. Um, so once you have the PowerShell engine, what happens is that somebody does something in PowerShell and then what'll happen is that then it'll come down here and it'll do that get feedback. So your function will get a call to it saying, your, excuse me, your, um, your, your C Sharp class will get a call to it saying, hey, we want, you know, some, the user did this thing uh, and did you want to provide feedback? And then it's your option in the code through this iFeedback provider for your module down there at the bottom. First you register your module, that's just a ceremony thing. But then once you implement the interface, then every time something happens in the code that is relevant to you, because you can register, I wanna register to you know, only run my code like if it's an error, or run my code regardless, so I can always check and then just skip it. Then you, then you can see everything going on in the AST, what the commands user did and what his last error was, and then offer up return an object that basically provides all the information to provide a suggestion. Um, the thing about this too is that due to the nature of how the thing works and so that it doesn't lock up the console, there is like, I believe it's an 80 millisecond limit. I think it was up from 20. But basically like you have to do this very fast. So there's no like, you shouldn't use this for like to try to go fetch a chat GPT answer because by the time it comes back, it'll have timed out and it'll look like your thing had done nothing. So that's one thing you do really have to keep in mind when you write these is that there's a hard limit and there's no, there's no warning to you that, hey, your feedback provider hit the hard limit. It's just like your thing will just fail for no reason with no feedback, ironically. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, so you'll just, it just won't work and you'll, if it's just because you went over that 80 millisecond. So anything you do with this, it's very similar to like the predictive, um, if you wanna write your own predictive source plugin, like those have to be under 20 milliseconds. So whatever kind of evaluation you're doing, probably shouldn't do, try to do anything online. Like you should have whatever, data you need, like knowledge base or whatever, should be local, or you should have a command that first fetches and pre-caches that locally so that when your feedback provider is running, it should only be grabbing any of that kind of local stuff. So we're just gonna go straight to demos. That's my dog Spock. So back to that article here. Oh, I bet this is my fault, one second. It is 100% my fault. There we go. So, uh, so this is the article that I referenced earlier, and what this goes through is this explains the whole process. So you will start a C Sharp class, and there's that diagram I showed earlier. So you start a new class library, you do all the fun C Sharp stuff here, uh, you implement an init class so that this is for when it joins, it onboards and removes, and then you add all these class members so that you basically you have your class and then you implement uh, the aspects so that this implements that uh, feedback provider aspect. And then you add your suggestions, uh, you know, using the AST or whatever. And then you can do a try get alias. Uh, and then if you need to do a suggestion for failure, you can do that. And then finally you add in the part that actually has for the feedback tie-in and put that in. Simple, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, this, yeah, okay. So if you're not a C-sharp developer, I get it. Like this is a, a wall of like, I have no idea what's going on here. So. What we're gonna cover a little bit later is I will show you I made a module that lets you write these in PowerShell. So just keep that in mind when we get to that point. So I'm gonna go through a lot of the kind of guts of this um, just so you can kind of see what the internals work. Don't worry about not understanding it. I, I told, it just, it'll just give you an idea of what's going on under the scenes. But then I will show you um, a module that I made where you just, you, you basically just feed it a script block. So, but, but. Once, if you want to do those or you, for instance, if your module's already written in C Sharp and you're like, oh, I could provide, I want to, provide a certain amount of feedback for something that I'm doing. Like say you're making API calls and they go to um, connect and they've forgotten to like include a certain, like you're expecting a certain environment variable to be there. Um, and your module normally like, you don't want to present like, a, a, you don't want to throw an error, but you want to give them a note. It's like, hey, for the future, you might want to set this environment variable. It could make your you know script run better. Otherwise, you know, add this thing and you'll never see this message again. Um, but that's where like the feedback providers can become important if you are a C Sharp developer, if you are writing your PowerShell modules, binary modules, yeah. yeah. Yes, it does. So what, it has a registration, so sorry, the question was, does it support multiple feedback providers for multiple, multiple responses for multiple feedback providers? And the answer is yes. Um, what happens is that it has a registration uh, function. So when you write your, um, 
when you write your, and we'll show that with the script feedback provider, when you write your feedback provider, <clears throat> you, um, you, you register it as part of the process. So you'll register it, it'll have a unique ID, and as those are registered, basically, when it's time for feedback, it just kind of loops through the ones that are registered. But if, if, if each one returns a result and you can return multiple results, then all those results get aggregated at the end. And it's got this nice little like hierarchical um, look to it. So in fact, I'll go ahead and just show an example here. The time limit is per provider. So your provider needs 20 milliseconds. The next, or 80, actually, what is it, Stephen? Is it 80? Is it 100? Oh man, that's luxurious. <laughs> but yeah, I know those were 20. I thought it was, uh, anyhow, so yeah, so I've been saying 80, it's 100. I'm, it may change uh, in the future, but um, in short, basically like for your provider, for the one, when, when your get feedback method is called, you have 100 milliseconds to complete that before it just silently drops you and moves on. Um, like in my, like most of my ones that I do, because all they do is basically like parse the AST and look for issues, like some of the ones I'll demo here, like they generally complete in like less than two milliseconds. So like as long as you're working locally, you know, if you gotta make a query to database, if you got a little SQLite thing, as long as you can do whatever you're doing within, you know, 100 milliseconds, then it's, you know, again, in computing time, that's actually a, a good amount of time as long as what you're doing isn't bound by like trying to make a network call or something like that. So you can get a lot done if you have some sort of like offline database. Like, an example of this could be is like there are certain errors that you, in your internal company you know cause there are certain issues. So like if you have a fast enough local network that you could make a query out to a, a small database that could return fast enough, you could have something like the most common like help desk things you have or the most common errors that happen. You could have something always watching for those and when it comes up, you're like, oh, well, you know, we know why this happens. Go, go see this internal knowledge base article and literally have that just come up in the console after the person has typed it and be just like, oh, okay. And they can, they'll have their hyperlink and they can click it and then be like, oh, okay, that's how I fix this kind of thing. So um, as an example, uh, do I have it loaded here? I do. I, so I, I have, um, this is a, a little bit of a spoiler for the script feedback provider. So I have this one that's for recommended actions. And so this is a very simple one that if I do, if I write an error typically, you know, everyone knows what that looks like. But say I have a script for something and um, if you don't know this, write error has this parameter called recommended action. And this, you know, in my opinion, th because this was never really, really like exposed in errors and there is a pull request by me that's been like sitting there for four months, no shade, you know, that hopefully it will get merged here as I keep harassing Steve about. Um, you know, since like PowerShell 3, this property has been on error records where you can put in and say like, you know, hey, you know, maybe there's a good way to solve this issue. But it never gets surfaced, so nobody ever uses it because it's not surfaced anywhere in PowerShell by default. So I made a feedback provider that surfaces it. And so what this feedback provider does is like when there's an error, if it's, it, all it does is it looks at the error, and if there's a recommended action, then it returns the result as that recommended action. So if I do this, you'll see now I get this little bit of extra text there. And so uh, it has, all of this is customizable, but the way that I wrote it was at the top part is I wanted it to be error recommended action so you know where it's coming from. And so for your thing about when there's multiple, then you just see this in, in that way. And if different feedback providers all the same header, then they all consolidate under that. And of those um, sections where there's the little extra caret, um, that's not me doing any kind of fancy formatting, that's actually built into the parser. So you sort of have these three levels of things that you can say, where it's your provider title, and then there's the topic, and then there's individual items under that topic. You can structure that however you want, and then all of that gets merged together to then finally present to the user. So here's an example, again, so when I have a recommended action, uh, here I have where I have that, and just to prove that this is um, doing it dynamically, you see the updated based on whatever my recommended action was. Yeah, if you, if, um, so the question is as far as like where is recommended action found? Yes, so recommended action is, is when an error record is generated, if it, it, now, if recommended action has been specified, which very, very, very few things actually do when they make an error record, you have to actually, you know, because you have to actually do, you know, how many of you even knew this parameter existed? You know, yeah, exactly, thank you very much. So, um, and then if you're doing it in C Sharp, it's even less, uh, it's even less obvious. So the people who write the AZ modules, the MG modules, you know, like, this isn't a thing, and they're also not gonna bother with it because it's not surfaced unless you actually go looking for it. Um, so, so I am on a crusade to change that, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, so the way that that works um, in terms of that is that, but yeah, if, if you have, if I did, in fact, I'll show you right here. So that did actually error. I can do error zero or get error kind of a deal. I don't know if it's actually on the default get error properties, but sorry. 
Yeah, it is. So it's, it's, it is, I was just looking to see if it was on like the default view. So you have the uh, error record itself. And then, as long as, oh, I think that was my action preference stop exception. Yeah. There we go. And uh, error details, I don't know why that's not auto-completing. Yeah, so then error details is just an object here that has uh, properties that are message, and then there's that recommended action. So, um, so this is where like that gets surfaced, and so if it's there, um, and a fun trick, like you know, you can you can edit these error details. Like when it, uh, one of my common patterns is like if I get an error and it's like obtuse, then I'll go in and like in my try catch for that. In my catch, I'll actually go in and rewrite the error details message to be more descriptive, and but that doesn't change the that part is mutable, but the rest of it is not. But if I do that, it still preserves the stack trace and all the other information about the error. But I'm able to give the user, like, I'll probably take the original error and then, you know, effectively do, like, what recommended action here does, which is give them a little more information, like, have you thought about trying this? Or this usually happens because this, or that kind of a thing. So because recommended action isn't typically surfaced, I've just been appending that to message. But hopefully in the future, like, this is by default. Um, but again, the point here being is that this was something that didn't exist, and I was able to make a module that um, surfaces that. <clears throat> so, if we go over to uh, what that looks like, um, well, first what we'll do is we'll start with um, one that I made that is for, uh, is for, is that, uh, where did it go? It's probably in my other window. No, I'll probably start it over, okay. Um, so I, I, made a, um, I made a module called MGAQ Detect, and it stands for Microsoft Graph Advanced Query Detect. Who here's used the Microsoft Graph module? Who here's ever tried to use like dash search, and then it blows up horribly, and then you spend the internet for spent like three days, like why does this not work? And I think they have better messages now, but basically like you, because of the way that the Graph API works and the way they implement it, you have to also have to add dash consistency eventual dash count variable CV or whatever. So, and if you forget to do that, it's not always obvious. Like, it doesn't always error. Sometimes you just won't get the results you're looking for, and you're just like, what is going on here? So I made a feedback provider that detects all the situations where that happens. Um, let's see. There is an article about it. Microsoft Graph Advanced Query. Yeah, this one. So they list out here all these scenarios with very specific properties when you have to use the extra consistency level eventual. So, you know, so you can go back in this and try to remember when this happened, or you can just use my module. I went through and I implemented uh, um, uh, uh, a feedback provider that looks for when you've done any one of these scenarios in the graph commandlet for any commandlet, like because, because you're able to just work against the AST, for any commandlet, it looks for that and finds out if you, if you where are doing one of these what requires advanced parameters, it'll tell you, hey, you probably need to add consistency eventual and count variable to it. So let's hopefully see if that works. This will be a magic trick. Uh, is my tenant still connected? Come on, come on, yay, sweet, okay. So I do get MG user search, like display name okay. So here's an example. So they're getting much better about this where they, um, where they have that and, oh, look at that, they actually have recommended action on this one. Hey, good for the graph team. It's not a very helpful one, but at least it's there, you know. So, so um, this is an example of my, my recommended action feedback provider. Like, I didn't jump out of this yet. So, again, it doesn't matter what the code is. All it does is it looks at the error. Does the error have a recommended action property? And if so, surface it. And we'll look at a little bit of what that code looks like here in a bit. It, um, using my script back feedback provider, this is much simpler than it sounds to implement. You'll be, you'll be, I think you'll be surprised how simple it is. So if I import my... DMG, and this should be out on the gallery. I'm just doing my local one that I have here. DAQDetect.psd1. So on import, if I do this again, okay, so now that I did it, notice when I did this search, it didn't work, but now I have an additional recommendation from my Microsoft Graph Advanced Query that says the following command combinations were detected as needing advanced query capabilities. Ensure you add dash count variable, count var, and consistent level eventual to these commands, or you may get unexpected results or empty results. And then I find in the AST, you know, where that issue was. So I, if you have like a full script, this thing will repeat over and over and over again all the places where you screwed up and forgot to put the advanced query filters. So 
you know, to me, this was like a perfect example to implement feedback providers because this is something that people mess up all the time. This is this is one of those like like you know like Null's always called like the two billion dollar programming mistake, and like to me, like this is like the null of Microsoft Graph because it's just it, you know we've argued about it a whole bunch on the forums like like you should just make enable this by default. They don't want to do it, and so uh, you have to so you just have to remember this. But it's it's so unintuitive and doesn't inform you that there's so much, I'm, I can't imagine how much IT productivity of people suffering in silence who don't post on forums at all, trying to figure out like why their query only returned three people instead of the 12 they were expecting. And it was just because they forgot those extra two parameters. Yeah, so the question is um, that this seems a lot like script analyzer and give the man a hand because I 100% agree. And uh, for more on that, um, there was a guy in the back of the room there named Steven and he's the one you're gonna to wanna to talk to to complain about that and also, because I agree. I, so a little bit, that's kind of one of my wrap ups is that yes, I, in my opinion, there's a lot of overlap between this and Script Analyzer and this is still an experimental feature so it can evolve as, as goes forward. So like my opinion is that you should just be able to take Script Analyzer rules and just add an attribute to them to make them feedback providers if they were relevant to be in that sort of interactive way. But it shouldn't be having to reinvent the wheel when we already have a framework for doing like analysis. It's a little more complicated because Script Analyzer doesn't really have any kind of mechanisms or anything built into it to analyze like errors in real time. It's more about static analysis of code. But that doesn't mean we can't make a new interface that builds on the old interface that exposes additional things for that. So a script analyzer can implement support for that and then very quickly be able to just be turned in, be registered as a feedback provider. So that's my opinion of how it should go. There's complications with that. You know, I don't have all the challenges that Steven has, so it's easy for me to pie in the sky, say what it is. Um, but, but I agree with you. This, this, so you will see a lot of overlap with like script analyzer. But the good news there is that if you've written script analyzer rules before, if you've tried that, if you've messed with the AST at all, then this will look very, very familiar, and it'll be really easy for you to write them as they are today. <clears throat> All right, so let's go to, we're doing pretty good. Uh, so here's an example of, of that, um, that graph feedback provider. So the key thing is that, um, so again, this is all C-sharp. If you don't understand C-sharp, don't worry about it. You know, we're just gonna hop through this real quick. So I have a class. And this class implements an interface, which is basically a contract saying an application can say, hey, if you imp I want you to implement this stuff in a standard way, and then um, you, know, you can work with me. And so if I go to this, you'll see there's basically just a couple things here. One of which is that you have a trigger, which is basically when you register it, is basically do you want to trigger on um, all messages, like success or not, every command the person runs, or do you only want to get notified when there's an error so that your code isn't wasting time looking for things. And then finally, the only other thing you have to do is implement this method called get feedback. You are provided a feedback context, which we'll go into here in a second, and you're provided a cancellation token, which just simply means that if your code, um, if, if, the, if even though it's only like 80 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds that you get, if the user hits control C or otherwise cancels, that control token is just something you should be checking that if, the, if that thing switches to cancel, that means the user hit control C or something needs to cancel your process and you should bail out of whatever, like if you're querying a local database or whatever, you know, and again, probably most of the time, like, you know, it's not gonna make a meaningful difference, but it's there so that, you know, again, just to make it as fast as possible. So even just like that little bit of extra milliseconds doesn't make the user feel like everything is slow. Um, so inside a feedback context, which is probably not gonna let me go to because my VS Code C Sharp is not very happy about this. Um, so I, I could probably go find this on GitHub, but basically within a feedback context is you're gonna have uh, what the script was that the user ran as a property. You're also gonna have what the last error the user occurred, encountered, if any, if there, was an, if there was an error, as another one. Now, one enhancement I've said is that it's only the most recent error, you can't see a chain of errors. So like if this isn't a script and it's like down here, there might be some additional errors that happened in previous commands that might be useful for you to provide a feedback provider. As of today, you can only see the very most, like basically dollar error, you know, zero. You can only see the first, the most recent error that occurred. So hopefully we'll be able to see more than just that and see like more context for a script, but as of today, you'll only see the most recent error that the, the user ran into. And so then based on that, you return a feedback item, which again, it probably won't let me go to. These are all in the VS, as you can see here up here, this decompilation. It's uh, pulling it out of the, um, the, the uh, PowerShell source code itself. So you can go to the PowerShell source code and see like how all these are implemented. And usually this go to works and you can see the detail, but my, my stuff's busted, so um, it'll, um, that feedback item is what you return, and basically you're returning information about uh, what, what, what your feedback provider is, what it should, um, 
what the response is to the user, you know, like that info that I showed there, and you know, any additional detail that you need to do. And that's basically all feedback provider is. It's just implementing this one method in the end. But there's a lot more involved. There's some ceremony that you gotta do in terms of, uh, in terms of registration. So once you have that, so here's my inspection process for the graph error thing. And basically we have a message, a statement, and I'm just going through here. If, and I have kind of quick filters, like you know, if, if the error didn't say bad request, most of the time it's not gonna be relevant. So again, I just I quickly fail out of the path and uh, just check that target object. Uh, you know, um, in the object of a, of a graph failure, it has information about the query. So I'm basically looking like in this case, if you had a filter and you uh, had count, then return that particular error. And this just goes through all those different scenarios that were on that list. Um, this is just kind of checks each one of those and hops through them and does, you know, checks like order by has a thing. If the parameter has order by, then you need to return, hey, you need to do the um, extra stuff. So this isn't too complicated, but you can see here's that script block stuff and the AST searching and blah, 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 blah. Um, um, but in the end, that's ultimately what happens there. And then I've got some extra stuff down here in terms of all the strings saved as well as then there's this part. This is a special thing with modules. There's just simply, this is something that just runs whenever the um, um, script starts up and closes down. And the only thing it's doing here is registering with the, uh, with the feedback provider. So again, a lot of ceremony, a lot of stuff. That, that's 158 lines to, you know, just to do that. So I made one called Script Feedback Provider. So this is out in the gallery, and all you gotta do, you can install it, but most of, the time, most of the time you won't be installing it directly, you'll be making a dependency on your module. So Script Feedback Provider does all the same thing as you saw there, but it sets up everything so that it can take a script block that you give it and do all the stuff so that you can return it. So if you're familiar with like writing argument completers or that kind of thing, I basically I was following that model. Like I wanted um, you to be able to write feedback providers sort of like the way that you write argument completers. So again, you don't need to care about what any of this means. This is all the magic that happens behind the scenes. But if you're curious, you can go out and see the repository for it. And so the net result being is here is a module that I made. Um, this is this is a module that this is the module that runs so that recommended action one that you saw. That's the code to do it. So you, if you want to do this, all you got to do is use my register script feedback provider command. You name your uh, provider, and then in the script block, you're provided that, that, that feedback context object that I mentioned. And if you, um, if you, uh, if you um, put the actual type on it, you'll get IntelliSense for that context object. So you'll be able to dot and see all the details. And then finally, you just return this feedback item object, which again is built into PowerShell 7. So you'll see this uh, feedback context. We'll see where it is. You know, you can see all the details of the properties and everything like that about it. So you can see those like directly. But for a new feedback item, if we go feedback item new, I probably got it. I don't have this completing. So, so you'll see there's a few different ways uh, you can do the constructor. But pretty much it comes down to a header and then a list of those action items. And we can go to like what the, those actions are just strings. And then you have an option for your layout um, in terms of like how you, what you want to lay out like vertically, you want to lay out horizontally, there's different kind of formatting things. And this is all in that article that I showed earlier. Um, again, we're kind of tight on time, so we're not gonna spend too much time on it. But you have all these options for how you lay things out. So when I'm doing this, as you see, this is real simple. I take my context, and if the context.lastError, that's that special last error property that we talked about, um, and then the error, dot error details, which we saw earlier, dot recommended action. I'm just basically, if that exists, then okay, my feedback needs to provide it. So I create a new feedback item, the last error has a recommended action, and then output the results of that recommended action. So even without running the, saving this as a module, let me make a new shell here. So I have script feedback provider in my path. I do, okay. And just to show that that's actually doing something. So I'm importing this, now I have three new commandlets. And so first I'll just do git script feedback provider, so there's nothing up my sleeve. So right now there's no script feedback providers registered. And so when you do register, we're just gonna copy and paste that same thing that I did before. So now I've registered that feedback provider. If I do, so what, what that, just by running that commandlet, in the background, it does all the stuff that you saw previously. I, I made a sort of scaffolding that register, you know, does that registration step you saw in the C sharp, um, makes makes an instance of it that adds your code to the Git feedback and does some magic in C sharp to make it run in a run space and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then whatever your output is for that object, 
to then um, have that result. And there's also some magic in there that like, if you don't output the right kind of, you have to return that result item, but you can also just return a string. I've set it up so you can just, you can just return a string and it'll just assume that you wanted that as an action and it'll build the feedback item for you appropriately. But if you want it to be more reduced, if you want more detail, then you actually return an actual feedback item. I also made it so you can return a hash table. So like if you don't understand this whole class feedback item colon colon new, then you can just return a hash table that has those two properties and it'll, it'll do that work for you too. So now I get feedback, skip feedback provider, and so there is that feedback provider that I made in that script block. And then I can just, again, do write error, and there's my feedback. So just to, again, just to show there's no magic here, I'm gonna get script feedback provider, and we're gonna unregister that one. Every, of course, because I believe in everything being very PowerShell, everything's pipelineable, so you know, the object's there, you can just pipe to unregister, and now we don't have a feedback provider anymore, and now that doesn't happen anymore. So now we can register a new one, but we could change this. Don't believe, don't believe there lies. And now that I've registered that one, the last error has a recommended action. Don't believe there lies, don't do it, don't do it. Yeah, but that's just a shell, it's like, again, uh, what is in the script block, whatever you write in that script block, just like an argument completer or whatnot, um, ends up being your recommended action. So that, that's a lot easier than that, that wall of C-sharp. And so, so it's a good thing that that interface is there, especially if you're currently writing a C-sharp module, um, because it makes it very easy to integrate that feedback stuff. But I wanted to add a little bit of extra tool. So th again, this is something that just, just I wrote. This is not a PowerShell team thing. This is just a community project that I did to um, make it easier to write these feedback providers. All right, so... Um, to show the context there, I think the next thing I wanted to do was, I believe, and if I remember right, I did get debugging to work with these, but probably not, so let's find out. Um, so I have this, if I throw a wait debugger in here, just out of curiosity. I should probably unregister the old one. Yeah, okay, yeah, because that runs in a separate run space, uh, you won't be able to debug them, but you can, for instance, like, throw a, uh, get that and register it. You can throw in a, like, a console log, and I think that'll work, but. Oops. Yeah, there we go, okay. So, so I'm gonna use that console there um, to, I don't know why I'm doing this. Yet. Oh, I, I, let me think for a minute. Yeah, we'll just do it here. So, and again, remember, the reason I'm not doing this, you can do this in VS Code, write them, and then like run. Just make sure when you run, you do the run in a regular PowerShell window. If you try to do it in this window, the PowerShell extension terminal, as of today, watch if I register this and I do it, Nothing's gonna happen, and that's because it is actually working, it is all running, and if I put in that little console thing, that little console write line line again, let me just do a new file here, just to prove that. So if we take this one and we run it. Da, da, da. Uh, oh wait, I think it actually has been short certain. No, so we didn't even make it this far. So, um, so in the host, you, ha you, have to, you have to implement, you have to basically like um, in the PowerShell host itself, and this is all inside baseball, but um, when you're writing a PowerShell host, you, ha you have to subscribe to say, hey, I can handle feedback providers, otherwise they don't run just for efficiency reasons. So we have, so hopefully in the VS Code extension, more importantly, more specifically, the PowerShell editor services that runs under the hood, um, we just have to implement in the host there so that it, it registers saying, hey, I can display recommended actions, and then hopefully that'll start showing up here. But as of today, it doesn't. So that's why you wanna do a separate terminal, um, which you can, again, you can do it here, you can do it in the separate terminal, but again, just to show that it does work here. Hopefully, yeah. And so, so there it is there, and then of course, you know, harass Andy to make it work in the other one. 
<clears throat> All right, we're doing pretty good. We've got like, what, seven minutes left? So I, I think at this point, I'll go ahead and just uh, do a quick break for any questions. Uh, but I, you know, as you can see, the main, the main structure of these is that something's coming in, and you have you know, a way to update the message, give the user a better information, and then put them out. So the MGAQ detect, you can go and install that module today. All you gotta do is install the module and import it, and then just using Microsoft Graph, if you ever do one of those things where it's an issue, um, it, you'll, you will get that extra feedback. Oh, one very important additional thing. Because this is an experimental feature, and I always forget this because in a new system, all of these are gonna be false. So all you gotta do is do get experimental feature, and you can do the specific one, and you can do enable experimental feature. And so just by doing that, then you have to restart your PowerShell, and then on your system, all those experimental features will be enabled um, you know, for the remainder of, of the lifetime of that system. So until you do that, the feedback providers don't work. It's this third one, PS feedback provider. And in fact, so remember earlier when I was talking about that feedback provider? So this is one that the PowerShell team wrote. Um, it's, built, it's one that's right here, this PS command not found suggestion. So you know, I just typed grip, and it just did sort of a fuzzy search, and it's like, hey, did you mean gip, you know? Or, does this work with commandlets too? Steven, okay, so if I do like invoke, oops, invoke wrist method. Yeah, so hey, did you mean invoke rest method, you typing idiot? So again, so again, for most of us, like for most people who are like really advanced in PowerShell, um, you, you know, a lot of these are still useful for things like, I, I made that consistent plus level eventual mistake all the time. It drove me crazy. Because it's not obvious the scenarios. Now it's gotten better because uh, and at the time, Microsoft Graph wouldn't give you errors. It would just it would just error out. They've done better, and they made it so that they provide errors that point you in that direction from the API. But there's still a lot of scenarios where it still doesn't happen. Um, when I was developing my um, my Jazz PIM module, which is uh, a way to do PIM elevations from the command line, um, ran into this all the time. It's so annoying. Um, so, but you know, here's an example. Just you know, it, once this becomes sort of like a built-in feature, you know, you look a few years into the future. You know, having this sort of, it just, you know, we've always been big about PowerShell being like super friendly and like accessible and you know, why we use descriptive names and words, why we use things like pipelining and stuff, why we use objects so you don't have to become a JQ wizard or an awk wizard. Um, and this is just another thing that points in that, in that mission, in that direction where you can, for a user, like if you're trying to figure out a command and, and you don't know how to use git command or you don't know that you can tab complete, you know, or you're just writing a script and you can't figure out why your script doesn't work and you're getting this weird message about command not found, you know, you can get this little additional feedback here. So I see this feature um, as it grows and it evolves being something that both really helps users, you know, but kind of falls into, as was mentioned earlier, um, being sort of like a complement to script analyzer, and ideally having the aspect of script analyzer rules. Like imagine if rather than having to run invoke script analyzer all the time for your own scripts, you could have things like I said, like don't like the existing rule that says don't use aliases. In my opinion, like it should be pretty easy to just simply say I want don't use aliases as a feedback provider. Some some command let's set that lets you register those and put it in your profile, and that way every time you use an alias, have the feedback provider come up and give you the same information that the script analyzer would have. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of opportunities in that regard. So that's pretty much the summary of that. Let me get back down here to. Want to make sure Spock's on the screen and all this, you know, so, something that's actually nice to look at. There we go. Uh, so yeah, uh, so at this point, I'll go ahead and take questions about uh, the feedback provider. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the question was, is that you can, um, you know, I mentioned that you can do things on success, and in fact, I do do uh, the MGAQ detect does work on success. So what happens is that the properties that you get is you get a property of whether it was successful or errored, a property that is the AST, that is the script that the person ran. So that script that the person ran is what you would do success tests against. So again, that's an example of alias. You know, it's like if they did, you know, GC pipe question mark, you know, brackets, whatever, that's a successful command, but you, you, your, your feedback provider would do get feedback and you would be given this AST. You would see, oh, you know, you used an alias here, you used an alias here, so you can still report, a, you know, even though it was a successful command, you can report, hey, you might want to try expanding question mark to where object, and you might want to try, you know, and, and be nice to the next guy kind of a deal. Yeah, so I think the thing actually as of now, um, like if, it, if it's a dot source script, and Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure today if it's a dot source script, all you get is like the dot source, you get the line, the dot source script that was run. It doesn't expand it. So you would have, but what you could do, like in that case, your feedback provider could go and then get the content of that script using GC, 
and do a static analysis that way. But, but that's not built in, if that makes sense. Well, I mean, like, while you're running, you're just doing the bits, not so, um, no, because what will happen is that the script will run, it, uh, it, uh, where it hooks in is at the end of a script execution. So yeah, if you're running like, like a 30 inch, you know, if you're running like a 30 second long script that like had a loop in it and like did, did the graph thing and was using the wrong graph thing, it wouldn't show up in real time. It would only show up at the end. But because you have all the context, like I mentioned there, is you can, where I showed like here's the command, an additional thing I could have done is I could have shown like the script line and the script column or made one of those like, I could have, I could have even used the, um, the fancy um, ANSI characters to like turn that into a hyperlink where you could have clicked it and gone to in your script where that particular one was. I, I just didn't get that fancy with that one so far. Good, good, good issue. File that as an issue on my own. Maybe I'll do it. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, for the record, um, there's, there's Stephen Bush is in the back of the room, and uh, he's the PM on this uh, particular feature, so he owns it. And so uh, the, the thing was basically, uh, the questions were about like, if you're running a long script, um, you know, do the feedback providers sort of stream in real time? And they don't, and the, the main reason that Stephen mentioned was that in their design reviews, um, they didn't want to pollute your actual output of your script, where like, you know, you're actually gonna care about your verboses or your warnings or your errors. And then this was just this is just supposed to be output at the end, but that way it's easier to scroll up and not have all this wall of interact. It also has to do with the fact that because it also does that consolidation of all the feedback providers, then you would get a much uglier output than that nice consolidated view you get at the end. Yeah, yes it does. If you if you want to write a script feed, oh actually actually sorry. So um, that's one last thing that I forgot. So thank you. Let me um, spot get off there. Let's, we, we need we need let's, we need to get back to work. Um, so um, I actually published that this, rec this so feedback that recommended action, this is published to the gallery. So you can download and install it. Um, and in fact, I have a console here that has it available. And this module is just two pieces. It's your manifest, which you need for a module if you've never written a module before. And it, all you have to do is you have to just require the script feedback provider module. So it comes, it, that script feedback provider module, if you download and look at it, it's just a DLL. And that DLL provides the whole framework. So when you're writing a feedback provider, you can do this from a fresh PowerShell 7.4 console anywhere. You don't need the .NET framework. You don't need the SDK. You don't need any of that. You can write these ones just like you were writing an argument complete or something like that. All you got to do is tell it, tell your module to depend on that script feedback provider module. And then when it installs, it'll download the other one along with it. And when it imports, it'll load that first so that all your code will work. Yeah. I don't, I don't know, Stephen. Is there like, is there an item limit where it like truncates or? Sorry, the question was, um, the question was that if say like there's like a hundred outputs, like at the end you just get a garbage wall of console output at the end that you can't redirect or do anything with, and like I don't know if it like limits today. So Stephen's answer is um, uh, there's um, not today, uh, and but the main thing is that because these modules are optional, because you again like the the script feedback is you didn't see them actually work until I imported them. And so um, the idea would be you'd only import the ones that you want. And again, that dovetails again into, in my opinion, like the whole script analyzer discussion is like, you know, you should have, be able to set in your profile with like a, you know, enable command or something like that. The same things like you would enable with, with script analyzer with like a, a analyzer settings.psd1. Yeah, kind of a deal. Yeah, so the examples uh, Stephen gave was that um, the one feedback provider that ships in PowerShell 7.4 uh, it the way that it does is just put everything on a single line, which you know will just wrap. Again, you could still probably end up with a wall of text, but like there's there's ways obviously to structure your feedback provider so they aren't as noisy. Yeah. Oh, we're gonna get deep, are we? Okay. All right. This is the stuff I like. All right. Yeah. Okay. Tell me. Yeah. Um, with the module, so um, if I recall, I have it warm up the run space pool. Um, I don't remember. I think on my on my if I don't, I should. Is that when you import the module, it should be warming up the run space pool. And then it reuses that run space pool. So we you know, in, you know, invoking it, it, your run spaces will have their own context. It clears out. Everyone else can like, you know, go to your phones if you want. If you don't care about this part, um, uh, uh, I wipe the initial session state each time so that it doesn't carry over, so that you don't end up with state bugs. But um, but it, it keeps the run space warm and the threads warm, so that um, I mean, like, I haven't actually tested like how much latency it has, but I can say like every script feedback prior I've run, I haven't run into a latency issue like where I've like been hitting the. 100 millisecond limit, so. So I mean, good thing to test and file an issue if you're like, hey, you know, this this is, you know, this should be warmed up so that we, you don't get a, a cold start, you know, false, false no report. All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and end a little bit early then. Again, thank you very much. Um, 
I, I actually, what we could do, I guess, if we have some time, um, if anybody thought of an idea of a, of a feedback provider that maybe they want to see me try to do live right now, we, we could try it. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could, I mean, I could write a feedback provider that if you use send mail message, says don't do that. <laughs> you want to try that? We could, let's try it. So let's see. Ah, uh, so if the context, I have to remember here. So ultimately, we'll just get to our end result is, well, let's make this quick. In fact, let's try it with just the, um, just to make sure the feed my, my example here. So you should just be able to just return a string saying, All right, there we go. Uh, <coughs> all right, so just, again, so this, you know, I always like to kind of start really simple just to make sure my output's working and then we'll actually add in the filter to look for it. So we'll do that and so I should be able to Register that here, and so now this. Um, oh, I forgot. And so this also, you can set a um, an additional parameter on this registration. In addition, so you can set in addition to like a des the description and that kind of thing, so that the description is what shows. I have a default description, but if you want to give a description, it'll show in that get feedback provider. But here on this trigger, the trigger is where you select it. So you can either do it on command not found, which is very specific to one particular provider because they wrote it, and so of course their thing is native in it. Um, error or success. So the default with my registration is error because most of the time it's redeeming. In this case, we're going to actually want to specify it on success. So let me again just get a uh, script feedback provider and unregister everything that's already there. Okay, so, so even on that command, I registered it. It registers before the command completes. So ultimately, like this is the output that we want, right? You know, send mail message, reality check, you send mail message, don't do that, think of the children, use mail as and make the world a better place. So then, our context, and I'm gonna have to go, this is why I wrote my own readme, so this will be helpful. So if you, um, if you go to the GitHub, Justin Grody, script feedback provider, it has a whole article here that kind of explains the different ways you can return information. So you have your header, and then your actions, multiple strings, and then what the context looks like. Uh, an example there, example on recommended action, and this example previously of just out by outputting a string, you can, um, you, you don't even have to understand that whole feedback kind of thing. And you know, it's like, all I did was output a string and it, it, it outputted that. It didn't get the cool little like arrow thing or any of that kind of stuff, but um, it worked. Okay, this is the one that I wanted. I want my IntelliSense trick. So if I get back here, where's the one? I lost track of where I was working on this. Must have been the other one. Oh, no, you can just go away now to completely. Uh, nope. This is what happens when I use like a demo version. It doesn't have all my fancy stuff that helps me find things. I'm just totally lost. Oh, here we go. Was I editing my? Yeah, let's just not do that. <laughs> let's, pre let's pretend I didn't just like live edit my my actual module. Not like it's published or anything, but sorry. That's right, yeah, see, timeline would have saved me, yeah. So if, if, again, if you don't know about timeline, which is down here, and if you're working on a document, every time you hit save, it's the word autosave of everything in VS Code. Does, you don't have, if you don't even have a Git repository running, it will keep a history of every, so here you go, timeline. In addition to your changes, it'll also have all the Git history now, which is very new. So you can go back in history five, six months and see all of that right there in the timeline. But you don't have to be running Git. Like if it's just if you're just working on a local file in a folder, it will remember and save that stuff. It saves it in your local app data info. Um, so very cool feature, like highly underutilized in my opinion, and has been there for a while. So yeah, definitely use that. All right, let's go back here. Let's see what we got. Five minutes. So, because I honestly can't remember what's in the context block. Let's do this. Is it? 
Oops. All right. Well, well then we're going to write a lot of feedback providers today. I was, I was like, well, I, I know what happened, because I thought Andy in my session yesterday was going to be 90. It was 45. I'm like, oh, OK, great. Well, I could have swore I had something that was 90 minutes. Well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good, because I cut a lot of content from this one, so we can just go back and do that stuff. <laughs> All righty. Um, so yeah, well, let's go ahead and write this guy. And uh, so, so we got this. We got our message that we're going to return. And so the context, so the tricky thing I'm trying to remember is with that, in, there's a way to add that I figured out to get the IntelliSense in there, because I am terrible without IntelliSense. And so there's a way that if you add it there, thanks to Martin GC94, who is one of the greatest PowerShell contributors of the last year, he's added all this great autocomplete stuff that you now works. You know, it's the autocomplete stuff all works in the PowerShell console, but because the way that we structured VS Code, as we talked about yesterday, is all that autocomplete stuff you get for free in VS Code because 90. 98% of the stuff that, of the IntelliSense that you get in VS Code is just VS Code calling like git completion to PowerShell and getting a result from it. Yeah. Uh, I, that was, I mean, I was about to do that, try to like console right line it out, and um, but for now I'm just, I, I want to actually get this thing going. Now, now that I have a, a dearth of time, like, you know, <laughs> I might as well do it the right way, right? So let's get this feedback context here. And I could also, um, uh, da, da, da. oh, no, that's not right. So if I'm right, this should. Yes, okay, great. Um, so by the way, um, is there anybody who's never seen this using namespace thing and want to know what that means? Okay, if, you, if you've never done it before, it's, it's kind of a whole, brings over from C Sharp. It just makes it so like if you've ever written a script and you have in brackets and you've seen examples where it's like system management automation something, this just makes it so you can leave that part off. The equivalent, if I didn't have this at the top, is I could take it out, but then I have to do this. And I hate that. Like that drives me crazy. Especially like if I have a bunch of parameters, like it's 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 so hard for my eyes. So I just I just tend to prefer this view. Um, it's just it's just more more contextual for me. All right. And so and what's happening here is that since that feedback context is there, every time you type, VS Code is calling that Git recommendation thing, and it knows. It's just doing an AST thing, almost just like your feedback provider. It's looking at this code. It's like okay, there's a using at the top. I'm in a script block. I'm at a parameter, and that parameter has a type before it. So since that parameter's been typed, I can know that this parameter has to have certain properties because it has a type. So I know that I can complete the properties on that type. So I have command line, command line AST. So the command line, that's the easy one. That's just like the text version of what somebody wrote. Uh, command line AST is the fancy tree. And so most of the time, like you can just use command line. We'll probably use it for this example. Um, the command line AST gets into the abstract syntax, that abstract syntax tree um, example. And uh, if you want some more on that, I did a PSConf EU presentation last year on the AST. Um, there are much better ones out there too, but that's one as well. Um, and it'll explain, it's basically just like an object representation of a script. It's what, when you write a script, it's how PowerShell takes just that blob of text that computers don't understand and turn it into an actual .NET object that breaks down like what a thing is in a parameter and that kind of stuff. And the nice thing about that is it makes it very easy to like do a structured search. So like the MGAQ detect, it doesn't do like a regex to find that you use search. It actually uses that breakdown structure to find that PowerShell knows this is a parameter, like dash search is a parameter and not like a, a operator, for instance, you know. Um, you could certainly use regex too, like there's no reason, you know, there's no reason you can't use regex, but the AST is so much more powerful because those, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions lines of code that PowerShell has to take that text and turn it into a PowerShell script gets done for you automatically. And now you can just reap the benefits of that rather than having to reinvent the wheel with regex or like or whatever you want to do if you don't even want to do regex. So you have your command line, you have your command line AST, you have your tokens, you have your current location, which is where in the script the error was found. And then you also have the last error, which has the script stack trace. And then you have for the trigger. So again, the trigger, if you were doing a success um, tr thing, uh, you could you can register for more than one trigger. Like you can register for success, error, command not found, and then you could just like have a quick bailout here. Like if it's not error, I don't care. 
But most of the time you wouldn't do that. Most of the time you would just only register to say, only show me the errors, and then you don't need that logic in your script and it's not wasting cycles. So in this case, we should be able to do context.command line. The simplest example will just be dash like, we'll do match, uh, send mail message. I, I tend to like to do the return to be explicit so that I don't just, because I don't just leave lines in my code. I like return and write output. There's arguments about this either way, but you know, if you want, you want to do it now without, that's fine. So, okay, so now we got this one here. And um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and add a description to it too. Okay, so let's go ahead and deregister my existing one, and we will register that one. And so now, first I'll do so. Notice it didn't happen, so that's good. So now we're not getting our thing triggered, but if we do send mail message, I know there's more parameters I probably need to get from, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, all right, why did that not trigger? Context.commandline-match. Oh, good point. Uh, da -da. I think, actually, I think I can register. Did I have this set to be an array? No, that's not an array. That one. So you would have to register separate feedback providers. That that's one thing that's also annoying that I, I filed a thing on. But um, let's see. Let's just do a. Yeah. It's like number. So number one, thank you all. Number two, you guys know way more about send mail message than you probably should at this point. <laughs> Why are you not using mail as our? No. There is, it's called Mailazar, it's great. <coughs> All right, I, let's see. Oh, oh, actually, I wonder, I wonder if I do error action, it probably won't work, but yeah. All right, fine, we'll say, let's, let's just try error, just for fun. Just, just to prove the point here. First, we will register it. Make sure it doesn't regularly trigger on errors. And then, are we actually even running? So this is where, I did have a way to debug. So if you're doing this in C Sharp, um, what you would typically do is that um, if you're like debugging these, you can, you'll, you would be able to put a breakpoint in, um, in your code. And then uh, when you run the feedback provider, once it's imported, It'll break point at this point so that you can troubleshoot and figure out what the heck's going on. Unfortunately, with this discrete feedback provider, there's not really, because it runs in a separate run space, there is technically a way to make that work, but man, it's a pain. So instead, what we do is, uh, um, you know, we're just pretty much just gonna have to do the old write line method. Um, I doubt write host works because that should get filtered by the thing, but usually write line's my uh, go to, like, get in there. So we'll try the. And line, hurt. And I'm bad at typing so much. Why is it mad at me? Oh, I know why it's mad at me. And it's registered. Well, let's make sure there's just not something messed up in my. Uh... Well, 
everybody gets to see my troubleshooting process. So, so I, I, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in always like, you know, just cutting the box in half each time. So the first thing I'm going to do is make sure there's just not something wrong with my feedback provider by just going back and just, we'll just try triggering just a simple error, you know, and just making sure that it works on a basic error. Otherwise, then there's, there, it might just be that something's not wiring up correctly with how I have it. And I won't be able to demo this, but we'll find out. So let's try registering this one. All right, well, looks like an issue to file. Let's try this. We'll, we'll do it, but we'll just put the thing in quotes as an example here. See, but I know the other one, now, yeah, whatever. That's true, yeah, I mean, we, we can dive deep, so let's see here, let's uh, register, that's still showing, right, okay. So let's just try, well, now nothing's working. This is the end of the world. It could be, it could be that the trigger's not um, registering correctly somewhere in the core of my code. I mean, I do wanna be clear too, is that, uh, it was with MGAQ detect, I wrote lots of pester tests. Like I'm very, I'm very proud of that. Look, I got, I got all these and I got, I even got them in C sharp. Like, you know, like I, I was a good boy, I was a good boy, I did my tests. I can't, I mean, it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't cause an issue. The only thing would be is that, I mean, I can, I, yeah, I mean, and the other thing too is like, uh, it comes in as an argument, so you can also just reference um, uh, uh, that. I'll just reference arg zero. You can do that too. Like that's another way you can reference it if you need the info. And at this point, I'm not using it. I mean, yeah, we could take it out. We can simplify this all the way back and figure out where our individual problem is here. Actually, before I do that, I can save it and then we can timeline it back. This is not, why is it saying it's a C-sharp file? Oh, it, was probably, it probably saw the using at the top and it's like, oh, you went all clippy on me. It looks like you're writing a C-sharp file. Let's name this panic demo. There we go. All right, so we will. I'm surprised nobody's called me out for not splatting this yet. Yeah. All right. So let's close this. Let's get a fresh. Oh, I'm going to be so upset if I've been doing this the whole time and I was doing the exact thing that I, I said I wouldn't, which is use the wrong PowerShell console. Yeah, yeah, I know. I did that on purpose. Let's do a net new one just to be safe. Let's do it in this one, I guess. Oh, oops. Well, now everything's broken. All right. Uh, I think it does. I think you're right. So let me just make sure I'm using the right one here. Yeah, that's the one. So I'm just making sure I'm using the one that comes from the gallery and not, not my local one that I may have just edited just now and screwed up. So yeah, I believe I do need to do triggers. Why is that not completing? Oh, it's because I killed the, uh, uh, fine, you can come back, be nice, don't let me, if, I, if you see me trying to run this in this console, yell at me. But I do want to have it there for my glorious IntelliSense. Andy worked so hard, I shouldn't let it go to waste. Oh, it's because it's not loaded here. One, one, one sin that I have not fixed that I realized I did last night is, um, in my uh, manifest for the script block, for the, uh, um, for the script feedback provider, I forgot to explicitly name out the, the function, so I just used star here. So, you know, there's always things like, you know, recommend don't do this, and the reason being is that the autocomplete doesn't work by default because PowerShell doesn't know the commands that are in there until it actually imports it. So that's why you do this, is that so that PowerShell can already know what commands are there without having to 
import the module and possibly run some code. So now that I have it imported, this should work now. Yep, so trigger error. Go back here. You know what, I'm just gonna make a function for this. Done enough times. Okay, so there we go. Things are wired back up again. So now, let's see that that still happens with send mail message. Good. And now we want our context. Let's first make sure it's showing what we want it to. Honestly, we could just output this as our error. Yeah, we'll need the param block. I can also use args. Um, thank you for the reminder. But we'll do the param block because I like param blocks. All right, bounce. Okay, so the command line is coming through. Send mail message, the command line is coming through. So now we shall try our approach again, figure out why it didn't work. <coughs> I'm trying to think if there's something about the regex for the dash would be a problem, but let's just do like, just for fun this time. Bounce. And there we go. All right, so now we can, first of all, figure out, I don't know what I did different. I guess it may be like, let's go back to our timeline here. Yeah, it could have been. So we'll go back to this guy. Well, let's, let's also make sure it works with success. I demoed that earlier, but. Thank you all for troubleshooting my module for me. This is great. It's getting so much better. Uh, okay, so let's uh, bounce again. Oh, uh, yeah, so it's probably, oh, but the, I'm not doing send mail message in the thing. Let's try. Okay, so success works, error works. At least, at least we've covered that. I don't have anything strange going on there. So let's see, so we got, this here, we'll go back to our original. So what are the differences here? Oh, I didn't save. Did I not save the original before I changed it? Dang it, all right, fine. Now, now I gotta be pithy with my uh, answers again. All right, so let's get out of all these weird difference windows. I have a thing, one of my settings in my VS Code is like, it only allows up to so many tabs at the top and then it just closes the older one so that you don't end up with this nightmare. There's, I can't remember the name of the setting, but it's, it's a nice one. I think it's called like max tabs or something like that, max editors. I don't know, it's, it's somewhere in here, but of those thousands of settings. But yeah, because I always end up with this, like which one of these is the right one? So I, I have it so like only, it only shows like the first three or four, and then unless, unless if, it's a, if, it's a, if it's an unsaved editor, it won't close it. But if I'm clearly just clicking through files, it'll just close the oldest one if it hasn't been modified. Unless I have it pinned by doing this, but with the pin option. All right, so we know this part works, and so we will. Uh, also, oh, well, I guess for, here's what we can do, actually. Go ahead and register this thing twice. Um, it, yeah, it, 
That's a good point. It could be because I had the uh, type on there. Um, there was a reason, I, see now I'm, I'm racking my brain. There was a reason that I actually had it work because I think, I do think I actually have super secret special code in there that it, it adds that automatically. Yeah, I think if you look at the script feedback provider, I actually stick that in there so that if you did that, it, it will still work. They're like, it actually does add the using namespace to effect. We can look here. Uh, yeah, see, so right here, before, before the thing actually gets executed, I actually stick that line on there. So if you didn't do the whole thing, like, it'll already be there for you, so. Because there's no way to bring that. You, you can't, using statements always have to be at the top of the script, so you can't stick a using right here. And so I was like, well, how do I fix that? I'm like, well, I could just inject it. It doesn't hurt anything if you didn't use it, so. Uh, da -da. So we got this. First, we'll make sure my loopy thingy works. Uh, okay, so now we're, so what I'm doing is that, again, because I'm just using that command, so now we're just registering it twice with a feedback loop, once for error and once for success. And ideally you wouldn't have to do that, but hassle that guy in the back of the room if that's what you want. Okay, so we have that and uh, Let's, uh, so we know that part's working. We got it on the command line. Oh, you know what? I think, I can't remember if you, when you throw an error, I think maybe the command line doesn't get populated. It's only in the error details. I mean, you might only get the AST, I can't remember. Let's, let's find out. So, um, oh no, we tested that earlier, that it wasn't that. So let's, this is looking good. So let's just do, we have, if the context looks like that, throw. Okay, good, so no, well, it should be working, so now all we gotta do is uh, make this feedback item nicer. Say, oh, fed back item, thank you. That's why I use my control, I didn't use my control space and I should have. As you can tell, I, I, am, I am like cripplingly reliant on IntelliSense, and it's probably the, the main reason I got so involved in the VS Code extension is to make sure that works. Because if it's not there, like, I, you know, it's like, it's like, yeah, not having IntelliSense is like program without a net for me these days. Like, like people are like, I just do a notepad. I'm like, are you insane? <laughs> I'm, I guess I'm just not a 100x engineer yet. Like I, I, just last week, I only had to be a 10x engineer. I thought that was hard. Now she's telling me I gotta be a 100x engineer? Man, it's brutal. All right, so. Uh, Come in there, take that out. Yes, all right, there we go. So there we go, so we did us. yeah, thank you, thank you. And just to prove, you know, not send mail message. Oh, because we had a triggering on success anyways. Oh, no, and because I did like, I didn't, I didn't, yeah, whatever. So if you were, if you, if you were doing this proper, and maybe, again, if we have time, we could, we could do the AST way, where ideally you would be breaking down the AST and doing a find that the function that was used was send mail message. And that would prevent you from things where somebody has send mail message in a string or that kind of thing. Um, that's why the AST is so great, is because all those, like, if you use regex, then you gotta account for all those situations. If you use the AST, all that's been figured out for you. So, uh, so what I do also want to show is that we can do, if it's in a script, um, I guess if we did context command line, you know, you'd have to find it there. But so um, I think, can't remember if I set mine up so you can return multiple feedback items or not. I think maybe you can, let's find out. 
Counts? No, okay, so this one will only take the last feedback item you, you send. I made it so it didn't freak out on that. But there is a way, um, oh, no, I know why. Um, it's because this second parameter is an array. So, so you have your top header that is like your, your feedback that you're providing. And like if you have a feedback provider that needs to provide like multiple things, like it can do this and then that and then this, it's usually best to make each one of those a separate feedback provider as opposed to trying to do all that work in here. Because you can pretty much only return one sort of like header message here, but then the individual items that are under it can be more detailed. Your header message could also be general and then your individual items is like, um, you're like we fit, your header message goes to be, we found these issues, and then each individual item can have the detail of the thing. So it, it really just depends on what style you want, you want your um, message to be. Um, but I'll just show here real quick, when you use an array. Bounce. Am I not getting my first message there? Oh, it's because I'm not, it's because of the success thing, I think. There we go. So you see here, like, I have the items in the, in the array, and so, you know, you have that, and then you have the first line, but then, you know, the additional lines that I put in there as part of that array, you can have as additional items. So if you added something like, was looking at a whole script, and like, so if you, um, my graph, the graph one that I had, if you paste in a script block, it doesn't work with the dot sourcing, as previously mentioned, but if you paste, if you paste it in a script block, and it had, like, three or four places where um, you needed to use consistency level eventual, it would, like, these arrows would be each one of those places where you did it, where you, um, where you uh, um, need to change it and fix it so that you don't just have to rerun it over and over again to find that. All right, well, we did it. So there, we, got, we, uh, we have your, so now a part of this would be is like, now you can't overwrite the warning. So like you can't, as a script feedback provider, like if that warning's already there, these are all just net new. So you can't intercept or do any kind of, it always happens after the script is run. So you can't like intercept an existing warning and fix it. You can't do anything with an error. Any of that kind of stuff you pretty much would have to do with like try catch around whatever the action is and then rewrite it as you need to. Yeah. So the question is, as far as the feedback providers, are they permanent or do they have to be loaded every time for a session? So the answer is they have to be loaded every time for a session because they register. So a part of the process is that um, if we go to, we'll look at it at the C-sharp level here, if I go to um, the graph provider. So the, again, this MGAQ detect, this is also on my GitHub, and so if you wanna see like the way to write like a quote unquote proper C-sharp one, the way the PowerShell team originally intended before I got crazy and made a script version, um, you know, this, th I, I consider this a pretty good example. And I actually have my own custom little AST query tools here. Um, so this test advanced query needed, this primarily does most of the work. And so, and this is where that AST stuff comes in. So in my part, you have the context, it gets the AST. I'm not answering your question right now, but I'll get to it, I promise. <laughs> um, I, just, I just think this is cool. And then I use link, which is, um, it, link is sort of like where, where object pipelining in um, PowerShell. Uh, it's just a, it's, it's a way to like enumerate through things really easy with a really terse syntax. And so I'm saying, so that find all and then the brackets, co command parameter AST, um, that's what's called a generic function. Don't worry about what that means. It just simply means that um, when I do the AST, I'm just doing a really quickly, hey, find commands in the AST. And I don't, uh, that short little line, you know, I don't have to do any regexing, I don't have to do any parsing, it's just find all the things that the PowerShell engine thinks is a command, whether it's, you know, ping or git command or search whatever. And in those, then select, you know, I wanna make sure that the parameter, they have a parameter that says parameter name, uh, make it a list, because I need a list for the rest of this. And then I go through the parameter. So if the parameter has, already has consistency level and count variable, then I don't need to, you know, even if the rest of it's not right, you've already done the thing that I'm recommending you to do. So I can bail out early, hence the return false or true. Um, but if it has like both filter and order by, then like that's something that I need to do an advanced query on. Otherwise, whatever the text was doesn't match, and so I bail out. And so that's, that's sort of like the core logic of how I'm finding which um, commands to fix, yeah, it would. And I'll, I'll go into that and just, I'll repeat and go into that for a second, but I probably should answer the last person's question before I go off on another tangent. Um, so if you go here into the feedback provider, we get down here and I do promise like my light theme is much easier to read, but, or my dark theme is much easier to read, but I, these projectors aren't great, so. So this section right here, 
Um, if you're writing a C sharp module, this is this is just a special piece in PowerShell. But those those uh, we keep talking about interfaces again. Interfaces are just these contracts. So PowerShell can establish this contract. Say, hey, if you implement this contract, here are these very specific methods you have to put in. But if you implement that, then I will call those, you know, at the appropriate times, and you can do whatever you need to. So one of those contracts is called I module assembly initializer and I module assembly cleanup. So I have a class that implements these and those two interfaces. Again, I should, these definitions should work? No, okay, whatever. Um, uh, that basically it says you have to implement this method and this method. So on import, that just simply means when, if, when the module gets loaded, when I do import module on your module, if it's a C sharp module, PowerShell has code in it that says, okay, if this module has implemented the on I module assembly initializer interface, then call that on import module. And then the module can basically allows the module to do some startup stuff. And then on remove. So on that startup, this is where I'm registering a subsystem, which is a framework that's in PowerShell for doing all this kind of stuff. Like the, the, the big ultimate goal would be is that so much of PowerShell, like all the remoting engine, all that stuff can come actually out of the core PowerShell and all, have all of them be registered as subsystems. And that way like the core PowerShell can be like Bash or that kind of thing where it can be like really, really small. That, I mean, I, I doubt that'll happen in the next five years, but that's, it, it was, it was, it's one of the like big pie in the sky goals. Um, but, uh, so, but this uses that same framework. So the framework's there to do that. Now all those pieces just have to be like ripped out and put into that subsystem framework. Um, but this is, what you're doing is you're registering one of those components with PowerShell and you're registering of the type feedback provider and you can see their provider is actually an instance of my provider that I've created here. And so, and I, you know, look, I even added comments because I'm a good citizen. Um, so that, that's how the module loads. And so what happens is that it, you're basically registering and unregistering. And when you run my, when, you, when you're doing the script version of mine, when you do that register dash command, on the underside, I'm just doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm making a brand new, I have a sort of like a dynamic like feedback provider builder that takes your script block and puts it in the run space and then it registers it with this. And then when you do unregister, it takes it out there. And I, I realized in my script provider, when you load and unload that module or if you force reload it, I need to modify that so it cleans it up. It currently doesn't do any cleanup, so you might get like some redundancies in there, but. Uh, so yeah, ba basically that's, um, that's how you do it. So the recommended ways to do this would be is that if you have it as a module and like you always want it present, then you should um, just put in your profile, put in your profile to just import the module. Um, if it's the script-based provider, then you can either, you can do it one of two ways. You can either just write it like that, or you can do it like I did it here where you can make it a module where you know, when, if, if you're writing a PowerShell module like this, if you don't put things in functions, then that code executes on import. I mean, the whole thing executes on import. Most of the time, you're just importing functions. So by putting the register just in the code, then it runs at the time that you import it. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So that's, you know, that, that's how you can make it so that they start up and not. So in terms of like, you know, deploying this to users, like you would have to put it in their profile or you would have to, if you have a separate module that um, you want to always have certain feedback providers, you can include those feedback providers as dependencies in your module and then they'll import automatically the second somebody runs one of your commands and then they'll be present. But otherwise, the only way to make sure that they're running 100% all the time would probably be to put it in the profile. Oh yeah, 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 okay, so the question was, um, another question about this was, um, <coughs> When you do the command AST, and we can demo that here. Uh, when you do the, uh, da, 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 so in my steps here, like when I was sorting through this, you know, I, it was mentioned earlier, it was like you have command line, command line AST, but if, if the command line AST was somebody like dot sourcing a script, um, then all you see is the command line is dot this, this script. In fact, I'll demo that here in a second. So the, the question was, was that, well, since you know what the script is, can't you just then go and then get the content of the script, parse that with the AST parser, and then still do the same result? And the answer is yes, you could do that. The tricky thing is like, where do you stop with that? If that script dot sources stuff, do you do that? And then at what point do you start hitting 100 milliseconds? So um, I think that just comes down to the contract that your feedback provider is. I think it makes reasonable sense to um, delve at least once. And I might, add, like for instance, with this script feedback provider, maybe I'll add an option to it to say, you know, when you register your provider, do you want it to at least delve one level if it was a dot source script? But don't go into like, go all the way into modules and stuff, you know? So yeah, it's certainly something you could do. There's no reason you couldn't. The only other issue I could think of, well, no, you'd still be, because if with the error, 
you would still be able to correlate the error because as long as a dot source script and not like a dynamic whatever generated thing, that error is still gonna point to that physical location on disk where that script is. So when you dot source it and parse it, you'll still be able to report it based on that error and point it to the right line. So yeah, I, I, so I would say, yeah, you probably absolutely could. I mean, again, we, we have plenty of time, we could try it. We could try building it. Yeah. I don't think so. Um, um, I think that, uh, it, I think it would depend on the feedback provider. If your feedback provider runs every time on success, yeah, that's probably, a, like, don't, don't do that, you know. Um, I think that, like, it's my view that, like, like, with the graph module, like, my graph advanced query search, I feel like that's something that should ship in Microsoft Graph. So, like, when you're running it, like, you know, you're able to provide the user with better feedback about, like, certain scenarios that may not be, uh, um, again, it's a, it, it was a perfect example for this, and this is why I made it. It's like, they don't want to change the behavior of the command. They don't want the command to error and give you a better error message that doesn't come from the API. Like, their whole philosophy is with those is that, you know, it's the, it's the Microsoft Graph SDK. It's not the Microsoft Graph user-friendly PowerShell module, <laughs> which, you know, we may all disagree with because, you know, it's, but, you know, but their, their approach is like, hey, we auto-generated this. We treat this like it's an SDK, and we expect the community to make the nice modules that have all that kind of stuff, yeah. We may disagree with that approach, but that's their approach, and I understand. Um, so, so change doing something like that, like offering more info in the error message, would be changing the error message that comes from the API, and that goes against their philosophy. And I can understand that because now it's just another thing you have to support, and they got a big enough surface as it is today. But um, I think um, in the end, uh, I, I think for a lot of things, if if they are things that um, really help, and especially with like error messages that you don't control or you don't want to rewrite, or um, especially like getting started stuff, I think would be really good. Like for your, you know, for your connect command, if they just type connect and like they don't add anything, you could give them examples. You know, you could be like, here's an example of like maybe how you use connect, and like then go to the examples in the command kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's my, my opinion is like, in my opinion, because you can try catch those errors and you, the exception can still be preserved, but you can rewrite the error record part with error details. Like my process, I usually rewrite error details with that additional information and then, but still include the original message. If you own the module, I feel like that's the best approach. But if you, um, if it's somebody else, like feedback providers are especially useful because you can do that for other people's modules, even if they don't do it. And that's why I use the graph as an example. Um, I think that probably has, again, this is an experimental feature still. There's plenty of stuff that can change in the future, and feel free to submit your feedback on the issues that exist in the PowerShell form, so that is 7.5, et cetera, you know, um, they go. But my, my opinion is, like, you know, if you can adjust the error message yourself, do it. Otherwise, feedback providers are a good option, so. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody, and hope you try out feedback providers.